Hello everyone. Welcome to RightsCon Online Asia Keynote. My name is Lisa Garcia. I am the Executive Director of the Foundation for Media Alternatives, an NGO based in the Philippines that advances human rights perspectives in policy advocacy around the internet, its governance, communities, and resources. And I will be moderating this session on Asia Keynote. Now, Asia occupies a third of the Earth's land area and is home to more than half of the world's population. China and India, two of the world's most populous and largest economies in the world, are in Asia. Now, given this region's size, it is no wonder that the cultures, beliefs, language, politics, and economy of the countries within it are very much diverse. Asia also accounts for more than half of the world's internet users, and the number continues to grow. And it is important to mention this because being in the internet and the breakneck speed by which technology is developing are impacting on people's rights from our civil and political rights as well as our economic, social, and cultural rights. We have seen how being connected has increased people's participation, allowed many, including the marginalized, to be seen and to have their voices heard, and contributed to the creation of new jobs and livelihood. But at the same time, technology is increasing the risks that people face. We have digital attacks, identity theft, and the like. And side by side with the development of the internet, we have also witnessed the rise of populist authoritarian states, including in Asia. Democracy is under pressure globally. Civic space is under attack. Repressive laws are spreading with increased restrictions on freedoms to express, participate, assemble, and associate. And while new technologies have helped civil society networks to grow, technologies are also being used by governments to control civil society movements and media freedoms, often under the guise of security. So in this session, we will be focusing on the situation in Asia and look at how civil society is pushing back against repression, threats to democracy, and authoritarian populism. Our keynote speaker will rate to us her inspiring story of resistance and resilience. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for this session, Ms. Bina Lakshmi Nepran. Bina hails from Manipur in Northeast India. She's an indigenous scholar, an author and a human rights defender whose work focuses on deepening democracy and championing women-led uh, peace, security, and disarmament in Manipur as well as in South Asia. Uh, Dina is the founder of the Manipur Gun Survivors Network, the Control Arms Foundation of India, the Global Alliance of Indigenous Peoples, Gender Justice and Peace, and, peace. and for her work, Dina has received numerous awards including the Anna Polit Politkovskaya Award in 2018, the Women Have Wings Award in 2016, the CNN IBN Real Heroes Award in 2011, and the Sean McBride Peace Prize in 2013. She was also named one of 100 most influential people in the world, working in armed violence reduction by the UK-based organization Action on Armed Violence. And she's also a board member of the International Peace Bureau the 1910 Nobel Peace Laureate. Ladies and gentlemen, our Asia keynote speaker, Dina Lakshmi Nepram. Dina? Um, and good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone who has tuned in from around the world for our fire chat session on civil society resistance and resilience. My name is Bina Nepram. I was born in the state of Manipur in Northeast of India that borders Burma. And I would, would like to welcome all of you uh, with an indigenous Manipuri saying, Mayambu Taramna Okjari. So today uh, it's been a whole day. Uh, I think some of you must have been watching the inaugural. It's been an amazing day at RightsCon. And I'm truly thankful to the RightsCon team for having assembled this incredible array of more than 7,000 participants from more than 100 countries. So it is a historic, momentous 
time for the people of Manipur and Northeast of India that you have included our voice in this meeting. So I'll be sharing about uh, what is happening in terms of women and indigenous people at this particular uh, rights con and then look at how the digital revolution and divide has sort of impeded many of our works. And then I'll look into what in Manipur and Northeast of India, how women, indigenous women have been resilience and resistance. What are the threats that human rights defenders have faced in this digital world? And what the United Nations and many of us and, and have done on this issue? And what are my re re recommendations? As Lisa said, Asia is home to more than 60% of the world's population. And it has more than, so there is one of the largest and most populated, populated continent in the world. But then Asia, where we are from, is also a place where boy child is preferred than girls. We have female infanticide, we have honor killings, we have rape and acid throwing, bride burning. And 2000, female fetuses are killed in a mother's womb even before they are born every single day in India. And according to Professor Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate and economist, 100 million women are missing in this continent. So this is just to share what is happening in terms of human rights situation in this part of the world. You know, India and Asia is a land which gave yoga, nonviolence, spiritualism. So there's a lot of positive things. We have 20 world heritage sites here. But in this uh, continent, we have one in two girls are married off before the age of 18. And more than 68% women in Asia have faced, experienced physical and sexual violence. In Pakistan, a couple of years ago, 460 reported cases of honor killing. And in the past couple of years, women's labor force and participation has tremendously fallen in South Asia, which is really, really a shame. In this context, what is the situation of indigenous people? I am a person who is an indigenous person from Manipur in Northeast of India. So what is the situation of indigenous people? And for RightsCon, uh, it is really important to bring the voices of, of all of us here. Asia uh, is home to two by third of the world's indigenous people. We have over 380 plus million indigenous people across the world and 260 of them are in Asia where I'm speaking from. And, but what is interesting is two of the biggest world's nations, India and China, have not recognized existence of indigenous people. China, for example, does not recognize the term indigenous people. And so, and, and what happened in Asia today is that it, the different terms given are ethnic minorities, hill tribes, tribal people, native people, that's the way people call us. Many of them refer to indigenous people in Asia as inferior. For example, in India, indigenous people from Northeast are given the term chinkies, chowmin, momos. And during COVID-19, indigenous people have faced so much of racism that our network noted 200 cases of racial violence against indigenous people of Northeast India where people have been asked to leave their homes, uh, stop from entering grocery stores, and spat upon in India's metropolitan cities and asked to go back to China because we, the indigenous people, look like Chinese or people with Chinese features. So there's a deep-seated issue of racism against indigenous people in Asia. So this is something that I really want our audience uh, to hear about. So. For me personally, as a woman, and then on top of that, as an indigenous woman, what are we doing about it? And what is it that we are feeling living in this kind of situation? So I would like to share that the story of indigenous people and women in Asia is not just one of sadness. We have created a story of resistance and, res and resilience. And I will demonstrate how. As I mentioned, I was born in Manipur, uh, a former Asiatic nation state which merged with India under duress in the year 1949. And since that time, because of this, the way in which Manipur joined India was under duress, there was a political conflict which emerged. 
and so too in the neighboring states of uh, you know Nagaland, um, you know Assam, and other states, uh, there were conflict which came about as a result. Uh, you know, more than for more than seventy years, there's a conflict going on in the northeast of India, which borders Myanmar. This is home, an area that I come from, is home to. 272 beautiful indigenous communities speaking more than 400 languages. And in this part of India, if you think India land of yoga, India land of Gandhi, think twice. In this part of India, we have a draconian martial law called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act clamped in this indigenous area since 1958. We have more than 350 military stations and a lot of population engineering and, and uh, women trafficking of indigenous people being sold into sexual slavery and exploitation has been going on. So in this part of India that I come from, more than 50,000 people have been killed. And in my home state of Manipur, 20,000 women have been widowed because of this conflict. Now, what did the indigenous women of Northeast India do in this part of the world? We have an extraordinary women's movement. We had our grandmothers and mother's generation in the 1904 uh, and 1939. We have a historic women's war of Nupi Lal, where women protested nonviolently against British colonial rule and, and their exploitative policies. And when armed insurgencies started coming, then the indigenous women of Manipur got together and formed Myra Paibis, that means women with bamboo torches and started patrolling the streets of Manipur at night with bamboo torches so that they can protect our indigenous women, men and youth for, from being taken away by Indian paramilitary because we have more than 1,528 extrajudicial killing in this part of the world. We also in other parts of Northeast of in India, the resilience of the Naga mothers, the Kuki mothers, the Assamese mothers and so many of the women who have, uh, have their stories. So what is happening, uh, just giving in context, so we are in this conference called Human Rights in Digital World. So let me take you to what is happening with in terms of digital rights here in Manipur and Northeast of India, which I just, just described, a region which is South Asia's longest running violence conflict. In the entire India, we have more than the highest number of internet shutdowns in India is not in Kashmir, it is in my region, the northeast of India, seen more than 19 internet shutdowns. This is the highest in India. And, and as a result, the freedom of speech and expression has been constantly curtailed. So for us, imagine, think for a moment, an area as militarized as India's northeast, already with a martial law. On top of that, you have an internet shutdown. For us during COVID-19, the lockdowns that we have seen we have seen lockdowns all my life of 100 days, couldn't go to school. Nobody could move out of the house. So this is currently happening. So many journalists in Manipur arrested and detained under national security law for posting critiques, criticism of the BJP government on Facebook post. So as a result, freedom of expression, absent, in the indigenous areas of Manipur and Northeast India, where I come from, because of martial law, internet lockdowns, and now compounded with COVID-19. So um, this is what's happening. And I'll take you a little bit about the larger context of India, where the Northeast of India falls apart, it is a part of. India is home to the second largest internet user base. But then, and then a lot of IT people come from India, they work in the United States, they work in around the world. IT is synonymous to India, uh, professionals too. But guess what? India's digital sprint is leaving millions behind. And so for every one Indian who has access to internet, there's another Indian who does not have internet, mostly really living in the rural areas. So this is uh, the issue. And India, the world's largest democracy since the coming of Prime Minister Modi to power has seen internet suspended, guess what, how many times? 269, I repeat, 269 times internet shutdown 
in India since 2015. 80% of all internet clampdowns in South Asia is in India. And UNESCO uh, you know, sort of did a calculation and said the loss that India has faced economically due to the internet shutdown is close to 3 billion US dollars. And uh, some of the sessions this morning also spoke about internet shutdowns in the world. And in India, the government can direct telecom companies to shut down services. So uh, that's why in Kashmir, we had more than 200 days of internet shutdown. And as I mentioned, more than 19 times internet shutdown in the indigenous areas of Northeast of India that I come from. Now, what is the situation of women in this digital India? I would like to say digital India is no country for women. So in India, we have, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's as, as a woman in India, as indigenous women in India, we're, there are so many things which have improved. At the same time, there are so many challenges that we face. India has more than 100,000 pending rape cases. We cannot go in a public transport after say 8.30 or nine at night. Women in India pay taxes, but then we cannot use the public transport uh, after a certain time because you'll be labeled as you are asking for violence if you're going out in a public space. So in such a country, what is the situation of women and in the digital world here? While 43% of men own a cell phone in India, only 28% women owe cell phones in this country. And as a result, what is happening is there are extreme patriarchal attitudes and beliefs in India, which has resulted, for example, in Mathura, in a village, a panchayat in Mathura, announced that girls using, if, if girls use mobile phones outside the homes, they could be fined 2,100 Indian rupees, which is about $28. So Kap panchayats and other conservative groups ban women and girls. They think that if women use mobile phone, they are morally loose, they will start dating. So they said they will control the sexuality of Indian women and girls. So this is, and by stopping them from getting access to mobile phones and other forms of data. So this is, I'm just describing what's happening more in minute detail about in my country. But let, let's see, let's take a moment and come back to where are we? We all welcome the digital revolution in every part of the world when it happened in the 20th century. It ushered the age of information age. And currently, 59% of the world's population has access to internet. But guess what? This has a huge digital divide between the global north and the global south. For example, in the global north, 87% people use internet. And how much of that in global south? In developing countries, only 47%. 47% versus 87% in developing worlds. In Pakistan, for instance, only 22% have access to internet, while, whereas in Bangladesh, 41% has access to internet. So the digital divide is so huge. Men in urban residents, young people are more likely to be online than women, rural dwellers, indigenous people, older, the marginalized, and many other communities. So this is what we stand around the world in terms of where are we with this information age and the digital divide. And the United Nations actually shared that if you want to attain end poverty in the world by 2030, which is called Sustainable Development Goals, then we should be able to address that everyone is able to access and use the internet. Till now in 2020, as we speak right now, that's not the case. And particularly, I would like to note that in today's world, 90% of the jobs worldwide do require a digital component. And someone once told me that, Bina, if you don't exist on the internet in today's world, we don't exist at all. Such is the importance of the digital world. Let's see what's the gender divide. I just shared with you the digital divide between the developed and the developing, like between the North and South divide. What about gender? Women form half the world's population, don't we? But we only, only 48% women have access to internet compared to how much percent of women, of men, 58%. And worldwide, uh, you know, 
software is a hugely male dominated world. Only 15% female software authors can be found worldwide. So this is the kind of divide that we are seeing both in terms of region as well as in gender. Now, coming to what's happening with indigenous people and uh, this uh, digital world, what is it happening? 15% of the world's poor are indigenous people. As I mentioned, 15% of the world's poor are indigenous people. And as a result, as I describe what's happening in Manipur in Northeast of India, parts of the places where Northeast of indigenous people live are highly colonized, militarized, weaponized, our women trafficked, our children forced into labor. So much of this exploitation going on. So imagine, and in many parts of Manipur where I come from, forget access to internet. We don't even have electricity. We don't even have roads. So this is the half the world that we are still yet to reach. So indigenous people have been actually left out in many parts of the world out from the indigenous of this digital world. While many of us are connected during COVID lockdown through internet, I also feel my heart goes out to a million others who don't even have, forget internet electricity, not have a right to the life, forget about freedom of expression. So on the other hand, indigenous people are also concerned like many other communities in the world of what is to be done with the transmission and protection of the indigenous knowledge. Because as we know, since the beginning of the rights gone, we've been discussing, what are the laws and regulations that nations have to do, UN has to do? to protect because there's still no, no protection till now on our data. So indigenous people are wary that the digital world is an extension, might be a part of a colonization process. There's no protection of traditional knowledge. What about intellectual property rights? What about collective guardianship and about compromising communities? So these are the different concerns that indigenous people have. Again, take a moment to say, the whole digital world is, as I mentioned, deeply, deeply divi divided, as I have just shared in the last couple of minutes. The other aspect that I would rightly like to touch upon is in today's world, digital world, human rights defenders. Last year, 300 human rights defenders were killed in 2019, out of which just in Latin America, American countries alone, 28 of them indigenous people were murdered for defending your rights, my rights, the rights of all of us to stay in safe environments. As I mentioned, women worldwide have access to only 48% of women have access to internet. But guess what? When it comes to online harassment, women are li likely to face 27 times more harassed than men online. Uh, for many of us, like myself, we use, for example, the stories and the history of indigenous people of Manipur is not in the textbooks of India. We are not in the narrative in New Delhi or in Washington DC or in Geneva. Our history, our language, our way of life, our civilization, our culture is not a part of the narrative of our national as well as global narratives. And as a result, uh, we used social media platforms, for example, Twitter, we opened Twitter account in 2019. And today we have half a million followers on Twitter. And in 140 words characters, we were able to tell our story. But that also comes with a price. Over Twitter, we have also faced attacks, uh, threats, and so much. A uh, couple of years, like uh, two years ago, I personally faced a lot of violence on Twitter where I've been called a secessionist, separatist for just doing the kind of work that I described, ensuring democracy, rule of law, and gender justice in my part of the world. And of late, in, in different parts of our country and the world, governments have been targeting human rights defenders. There have been cyber threats and trolling going on, which all of us who are tuning in today have seen. So cyber threats and a monopoly of strategies used by government authorities or non-state bad actors to be able. Websites have been censored, fake accounts created, 
And so all of these are happening side by side. And I'll come to personal data now. A couple of years, uh, months ago, um, Prime Minister Modi spoke in Texas, and then he spoke about the new oil of the digital age. What is the new oil of the digital age? Anyone here? The new oil of the digital age is the data of you and, uh, and mine, personal data is the new oil of the digital age. How sad it is that in 2020, so much of knowledge out there in the world, we are connected at, the, at our fingertips by just a click of a button. At the same time, we have lost it all. We don't have privacy anymore. And these personal data have been misused and collected. The fundamental human right enshrined in the Constitution of India, enshrined in the Const Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all of this have been taken away. In the digital sphere, human rights defenders have been put at a heightened risk because of the way our data has been stolen. Attackers can carry it, take away our data and use this to attack us. And this is what is happening. And as I mentioned, and I really love the campaign of Access Now and Keep It On campaign in which it says as countries face net shutdowns, must we work and ensure that we remain connected, be able to exercise our fundamental human rights, including the right to access information and express ourselves every single day. Democracy cannot run if our voice is silenced. Resistance and resilience is a part of a good democracy. And shutting internet shuts our decision-making power and our freedom of expression. And this is what we got to end together. So, and in terms of the gendered implication of all these challenges, as I mentioned, that it is really important that we got to involve technology, which can be a powerful tools, as I mentioned, for women and girls and people of other gender to become activists, we can use, there are good sides of technology that we can also make use of. In fact, as I mentioned, 90% of the jobs worldwide already have a digital component. And if you bring 600 million girls and women online, it could boost global gross domestic product by a whooping 18 billion US dollar. So when we are arguing for gender inclusion in the digital space, it is important that we are doing it to be able to, all of us that we could be beneficiaries of a global progress and not that only 1% of the world owns 99% of this globe currently, which is happening. And for us, the indigenous people, what is the way forward? As I mentioned, indigenous people are distinctly disadvantaged with regard to digital information, access and distribution. And a digital world can also be a powerful tool, you know. During COVID-19, I was a part of many of the online meetings where we had discussions of indigenous people and COVID and how do we safeguard ourselves. But then obstacles to connectivity remain. As I mentioned, there are so many parts of the world which are not connected by roads, by electricity, by internet. So there is all of these challenges still exist. And um, in fact, uh, Jack Panashi, uh, uh, he's, he's from Labrador, once said, in order for our children to participate in an equal level with leaders of the future, they need to have the same access and training with computers and the internet as children of other cultures. So it's really, really important. And to end with the last few uh, words, let us see, you know, I call United Nations as our grandparents. If our nations are not doing the right thing, let's go to the United Nations. So what does the United Nations do? And in, in fact, for indigenous people, access to technology, as early as 200, 2001, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 15, uh, 56 183 endorsed a holding of a world summit of information systems. According to this, there were two important meetings held in Geneva in 2003 and in Tunis plan of 2005. And in this, it was very clear that in the evolution, it was declared at this forums that the evolution of an information society, particular attention must be given to the special situation of indigenous people, as well as the preservation of the, our heritage and our cultural legacy. 
And then uh, following these two important meetings, that's why the, the importance when we build resistance and resilience, global solidarity is an absolute must. And so civil society coming together, indigenous people came together for the first global forum uh, and the information society in the year 2003. So this was, uh, you know, uh, uh, supported by the government of Canada and others, United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous People was a part of. And so as a result, they had an adoption of the Geneva Declaration of the Global Forum of Indigenous People and Information Society. So really kudos to the Indigenous people who formed. And then an International Indigenous ICT Task Force was formed. So it continues to pursue the mandate of ensuring inclusion in the digital age. So my final words are recommendations. So here we are in 2020. We are here at RightsCon, grateful to Access Now for the fantastic work they've been doing over the years on, on digital uh, you know, human rights in the digital world. It's so important that we got to engage. The United Nations in this, we need, as many have stated before, an annual digital gender uh, equality report is needed, I feel. And then we need to foster policies and projects and approaches to this digital, which are developed by including women and indigenous people. Do not speak for us, about us, without us. We've got to involve indigenous people, find out where are the indigenous people in our countries. Do not make us as tokens in your decision-making when you make digital policies. And we need, as I mentioned, to expand internet and wireless technology and nations need to have their own digital set of strategy and e-strategies. We've got to evolve them because it's a very important part as nations adhere themselves to sustainable development goals by 2030. National digital strategy is a must for including and ensuring that no one is left behind. And I'll end with this beautiful quote. And this was actually UNESCO states, stated a couple of years ago in which it said, the rise which is really important. Okay? We are connected by a, you know, a click of a button. Uh, we are having this global conference right now, but let us not uh, you know, sort of confuse that as UNESCO said, the rise of a global information society must not overshadow the fact that it is valuable only as a means. So global information society is a means to achieve genuine knowledge societies. In other words, information communication technology are recognized, we recognize as knowledge generating tools, but I repeat, they should not constitute knowledge itself. And I end with the words, wise words of Chief Joe Shirley of the Navajo Nation State in which he said, information is not wisdom. Information is without value, is without value if it is not available to those who need it. Knowledge combined with the wisdom of our peoples is what creates true opportunity. This is what we call upon nation states, the United Nations and the global civil society and the global digital world to include the voices of women and indigenous people. Thank you so much, Yam Nungaijiri. And thank you so much for giving this platform and for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bina, for that uh, wonderful keynote message that you delivered. Uh, that was actually a lot of issues for us to chew. Um, and I, I think the, the issues that, that you mentioned, they're happening not, they're happening not just in um, your part of the world, not just in Manipur, but also in other parts of Asia, in other parts of the world. And it was quite disheartening to note that the situation of uh, indigenous peoples, not just in your part of the world, but also uh, in other parts of Asia, um, the discrimination, the repression, the trafficking that's going on, um, yeah, and the status of women. We really have to do something about it. Because as we know, um, whenever there are conflicts in conflict situation, even in emergencies such as the COVID pandemic, it is always the women who bear the brunt the women who bear the consequences and who has to the women who have to take case when something happens when, when tragedy strikes and yet um 
in, in many parts of the, the yeah the internet being connected is very much um, helpful and yet you also mentioned that um, in many parts of the world uh, there's still a digital divide that exists uh, and, and this is very stark when when you zero in on the sector of women and indigenous peoples so um Bina, um uh maybe why why should we include why why is it important that uh women uh, especially the marginalized ones indigenous peoples why should they be uh included uh when when uh why should they have access why should they be included in in the internet and um uh how can we how can technology be used? How can this access be used to empower women? Yes. Um, actually, my, the question would be, why shouldn't we be included? Um, as I mentioned, that women um, form 50% of the world's population, half the world's population, but only 48% women have access to internet uh, access. And, and even in countries, as I mentioned, in India, only 28% women have access to the internet. Uh, so this is really, and whether it's about um, in the economy, as I mentioned, uh, if you boost the economy or even in democracy, working of a democracy, uh, if you exclude the women and the marginalized and other minority communities, uh, you cannot say that we are truly having, uh, you know, the deepening of our democracies in various Asiatic nation states. What is really tragic uh, in Asia today is this a rise, democracy, there's a backsliding of democracy happening all around the world and including Asian nation states. There's a rise of religious fundamentalism, religious conversion happening in many parts of South Asia, in Pakistan, in India and other parts where there is fundamental uh, ways of using religion as a means to build nationalism. That's why in, in India, uh, you know, we, a lot of internet shutdowns happen during the time of the protests against the Citizenship uh, you know, Amendment Act. Uh, and what does this act say? And as well as the National Register of Citizens, these were two really uh, discriminatory policies, which was brought about by the Modi government, in which under the National Register of Citizens, it was said that you have to show documents to prove that you're an Indian citizen. And it was this exercise was done in the past couple of years. So imagine, think for a moment today, whichever country you're watching this rights con fire chat from, if today, even if you don't have passport, you have your identity cards, Yet the government of your country comes and tells you proof that you have ancestry records from 1971 or 1950s. Proof that you, you and your ancestors voted in the last 30 years in this country. And if you do not have documents to prove that you can vote, then you are called registered as a foreigner in your own country. This is what happened in Assam in northeast of India in which 2 million people were left out of the National Register of Citizens. And we did an analysis of who were left out of it. And we found out that 69% of the people left out from the National Register of Citizens in India were women, I repeat, 69%. Because in Asia, in South Asia, women are the properties of their fathers, of their brothers, or their husbands, or some male member of a family. This is a patriarchy which we live in. And as a result, when a woman gets married, then except for her name and the clothes she wears, there's nothing that she can call her own. Forget documents, forget documents. So as a result, um, in, this, uh, the, in, in the human rights, in the digital world, if we do not include the voices, of women and indigenous people, then we are not, we cannot say we are living in global democracies. If you exclude half the women, if you include the marginalized, the LGBTQ communities, you exclude the minorities, the Dalits, 
we cannot say this is a true democracy. So inclusion of gender and minorities, indigenous people is a must in strengthening democracies. And the digital world can help. You can help. How, how long does it take to get electricity to mountain regions in Manipur or in Tripura? I have visited all these mountain regions in the last many, many years. I've been to many of these places, but they have been totally, totally excluded. Inclusion, a diversity policy in the digital sphere, as well as in every sphere of socioeconomic inclusion is what we are asking through this platform. Yes, thank you, Bina. Um, great to hear that you mentioned about the ID, uh, because um, a lot of countries are looking up to the Aadhaar system in India. Even the Philippines has its own national ID. And it, uh, it is great to hear that there are challenges there, which we have to look into before embarking on issues such as uh, already using digital ID and profiling. Now, you also mentioned about um, internet shutdowns. We know that internet shutdowns uh, are being used to silence dissent. As you mentioned, Access Now is monitoring these shutdowns under the Keep It On campaign. They happen uh, most of the time during conflict situations. Uh, and of course, India tops the list of internet shut shutdowns. And then also in some targeted um, areas, they happen, for instance, in Bangladesh, in the camps where the Rohingya refugees reside um, in the um, uh, Rakhine and Chin states in Myanmar, where there's military, where the military is in conflict with some armed groups in Indonesia as well. They there was internet shutdown in an attempt to disconnect the people of Papua. Now governments would say that they do this. Uh, they justify internet shutdowns by saying that uh, this is in order to fight fake news which is yeah, uh, uh, hate speech, lot of hate speech happening, and also um, to, uh, to, to, so that violence can be um, uh, curbed. That uh, governments are also saying that this is a uh, precautionary measure for public security, national security. So do you think that in a way governments are also justified when they say this? And why should we keep the internet on, especially for women? Yes, uh, Lisa, this is really something which has been troubling all of us. So imagine, freedom of expression is the fundamental right, enshrined in our constitutions, enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, growing up in a conflict area in Manipur as a child, I was always told, Bina, don't ask questions. We were always asked to keep quiet. This was like 15, 20 years ago. And today, Lisa, we can't even post on Facebook or on Twitter. In Manipur, journalists have been arrested for a Facebook post. We can't express freedom of expression is completely, completely scuttled. And as I mentioned, since Prime Minister Modi came to power, India being the land of IT, uh, so many IT professionals, even then, uh, you know, we had 259 internet shutdowns since the year 2015. So this is a, a great tragedy for India as a nation state, as well as many other nation states who think that by, what are nations made of, by the way? Nations are made of people like you and me. You cannot, you can rule and govern a nation well if we listen to each other. We express ourselves through our writing, our research, our posting. And of course, in today's world where a lot of, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it is not poor people of access to troll armies. Who pays to do the trolling? Who pays to do all of these uh, threats? I mean, it requires a strategy someone organized to do it and nation states have been doing it this is wrong and we need to tell them squarely in the face that we can't and we have a, a very interesting example in in assam where the government of assam actually uh, uh, shut down the internet and it was the Guwahati high court we ensured that the internet ban is lifted so we should uh, litigate 
We should work with lawyers. We should ensure that our freedom of expression is protected every single day. Right now, it's being taken away. And in fact, can you imagine the, the beginning of the digital age, which is the information age, and today in 2020, we are discussing disinformation from information to disinformation. We have to know and ask as experts who have created this. How did this come about? Who is responsible? It is not people like me or people, the marginalized indigenous. For us, all we are doing is to deepen democracy and show rule of law in our villages, in our regions, in our nation states. And we are being threatened repeatedly by just doing the right thing because of a, what I call the criminalization of a democracy is happening. And in, when we discuss uh, digital right, human rights, a digital world, we should also realize how important it is to look into these aspects while we do other human rights, how we ensure that kleptocracies, we are, it's not democracy anymore, it's kleptocracy, which is now ruling the world. It's a rising authoritarian regimes from Asia to you know, Europe, to the Americas. So I think civil society, as well as experts, thinkers, you know, good people or policy makers, we've got to unite to confront this. Otherwise, it'll keep going on. Yes, um, it's sad that um, even during this time of the pandemic, uh, even states are using um, uh, the issue of COVID-19 to repress freedom, such as freedom of information and assembly, as you mentioned. And this is true for, for many countries, like my country in the Philippines, where they passed the anti-terror law. There's Hong Kong also with the national security law. And yeah, because of this uh, repressive laws being passed, um, activists and critics of government uh, fear that it might be used against them. And yeah, uh, COVID-19 has really affected the work of human rights defenders like us. So given that, how can we as uh, civil society, how can we as activists uh, uh, push back? What resilience strategies do you see that we can employ so that uh, we can uh, restore the semblance of democracy that we want to see? Yes, I mean, this is a great question. How are we doing resilience and resistance during this time of the pandemic COVID-19? And all of us, everyone tuning in here, every part of the world have been affected by COVID-19. And India just crossed 1.4 million. Uh, and so what I have seen during these, so as I mentioned, in many parts of India, for example, Manipur in Northeast of India, that I come from, as I mentioned, much before this COVID lock lockdown, we had so many lockdowns. I've seen so many lockdowns in my life, combing operations, we have seen buns, Hartals and where we couldn't like step out of our home. So we, the indigenous people in Northeast India have seen so much of lockdowns in our life before COVID-19. And now we are seeing under COVID-19. Uh, and I used to joke with my friends saying, oh my God, we have seen <laughs> lockdowns before. So this is not new for us, this lockdowns. And what I saw uh, during COVID-19, a couple of trends first, not just as you mentioned the internet lockdown, uh, but during COVID-19, uh, government of India also tried to uh, give order to build dams all across the Northeast of India, given environmental clearances. Uh, in Northeast of India, there is a plan to build over 160 dams all across the indigenous parts of Northeast of India. And during COVID-19, in the middle of COVID-19, when everyone was just trying to survive, trying to stay safe and alive, suddenly there was a, a, a thing which says, you know, they, they are going to give the, the Green Tribunal is given a go-ahead side for these dams. And what was so critical was at that time was there was a whole array of resistance online by a lot of young environmentalists in India from the Northeast of India, as well as Fridays for Future, who actually pushed back. We took to internet, we took to social media, and I tried my best to amplify it through my uh, Twitter and other social media accounts. And, and, and it was 
temporarily stalled. So this is a very beautiful example of how when the young people were intergenerational, we come together and use whatever energy we have uh, to be able to push back. Uh, governments must not forget that they are made of people like you and me, young and old, uh, and we, uh, some of us, we are continuing to watch that, you know, nations and our countries are governed according to rule of law. Uh, we do not want authoritarian regimes, lawlessness. We don't want disinformation, which will, uh, you know, ensure me against my sister, me against my brother, uh, inter-ethnic fights through this social media where a lot of uh, disinformation is spread about communities and all of that. So that was one thing, not just internet shutdown during COVID-19, there were attempts by our governments to push, uh, you know, environmental, uh, you know, passes to ensure that dams are built. There was also in Assam, they tried to give clearance for coal mining during COVID-19. Uh, this was a, a, a elephant reserve, which they tried to, uh, you know, use it for mining and exploitation. And uh, because of the resilience and resistance by the, uh, by the communities, uh, young, the old, the indigenous and the women communities in the Northeast of India, it was pushed back. All happening in COVID-19. So that is one thing. And the third thing, which is happening in uh, many parts of the indigenous as well as uh, in, in Asia during COVID-19 is, um, I don't know whether it's done in Philippines, but today in Manipur, if you step out of the house uh, during uh, the lockdown, it's not a lockdown, it's a curfew. So they will fine you 10,000 rupees, which is about $300 if you disobey the lockdown order. So it's literally a curfew. So if you do not have a piece of paper which says you can move about, which only the rich and the powerful will have. So many, many poor marginalized people are under total lockdown in Manipur as we speak. I have been in touch with many, many villages uh, in Manipur during this time. And this curfew, which we saw early in the conflict areas, it is about military curfew now under COVID-19 is a curfew imposed by the government where the, where the national disaster law has been used to put be people behind bars for disobeying. And one of the funniest thing which happened last 72 hours was a state of India, I think Jharkhand, said that if you are found without a mask, you will be fined 100,000 Indian rupees, which is about 1,300 US dollar for not wearing a mask. So on one hand, uh, uh, the fault of the government, which did not put India on a proper lockdown initially, we were busy clanging pots and pans, but we did not have a scientific approach towards handling COVID-19 resulting in millions, millions of poor migrant laborers fleeing India's metropolitan cities, walking for days, months to reach their villages. And so as a result, huge community failure of the central government to ensure has resulted in a massive community COVID transmission from India's metropolitan cities to the rural areas of India, which is happening right now. So. India is now in the top three COVID affected nations in the world. So we have a lesson to learn that how authoritarian autocratic nations like Brazil and India actually have failed to contain COVID-19. And it is important for us as uh, you know, people and communities who are building democracies, working to open rule of law, to ensure that we stay in solidarity ensure, as I mentioned in the earlier part of my uh, sharing, that a national plan is built to look into all these issues, a national diversity policy, ensuring that we work on an anti-racial law so that indigenous people do not face racism during COVID-19 as well as at other times, uh, and to ensure that women and indigenous people and the marginalized are not left out of this. And as I mentioned, for this, we've got to work at the local level, galvanize community, local level. Uh, number two, we've got to work on the regional, national level. And, and like as we're doing in Rights On right now, we've got to galvanize together to learn from each other from different global communities. 
to be able to hold our governments and nations accountable. Yes, uh, thank you, Bina. And I think what you were saying is true, actually, for a lot of governments, a lot of states who are not prepared for this pandemic, even as you call it a curfew, some call it lockdown in the Philippines, we call it community quarantine, but they all amount to the same thing, lockdown. So our movements are really um, restricted. So yes, um, information is very much important, especially at this time, uh, because uh, we, we need to know what's happening and we need to know what to do. Yes, so, so because it's almost time or almost out of time, Dina, uh, I'll, I'll give you um, two minutes for your last words before we wrap up this session. Yes. Um, first of all, just to thank you, Lisa, for um, moderating this Asia keynote. I'm thankful to the Access Now team for including our voices uh, at this incredible, one of the world's largest gathering on human rights in the digital world. We were all supposed to meet at Costa Rica, but because of COVID-19, I think the good thing is that uh, I listened to this incredible speech by the, uh, in the inaugural this morning by the information te technology uh, minister from Costa Rica, a woman engineer. She was, she was a shining example of how women and girls uh, need to be in the field of STEM. We need to get more into, be more software engineers. We got to get into, let's not leave uh, tech to men, okay? Uh, uh, let men enjoy cooking. Uh, let women also enjoy how to, you know, code, how to ensure that we are a part of that uh, whole process because we still have a very gender skewed world of digital divide, of technology divide, divide between different genders. and. This is what we've got to bridge. For that, uh, as I mentioned, we need a digital uh, policy for, um, for, for all of us to make this possible. I work very closely with policymakers in India and at the, at, at, with governments around the world, particularly the United Nations, so that our voices are heard. It is so important to prevail upon our nations that we live in a very unequal world today. And we've got to bridge that first and uh, to be inclusive of women and indigenous people. As one of the earliest speakers in the panel said, um, it is indigenous, the digital world needs indigenous people. <laughs> our wisdom, our indigenous knowledge, our way of life will illuminate the digital world if you include us. So in your decision-making, in your planning, if not, uh, then we will continue to have protests, resistance, violence, if we have to bring peace to our villages, in our hearts, our minds, our communities, we've got to build inclusive, uh, you know, re, uh, you know uh, inclusive, diverse, gender just world. Without that, we cannot build any world, whether it's digital or otherwise. And this is what uh, I would like to work with all of us uh, around the world to be able to be the change that we wish to see. Thank you very much, Bina, for those wonderful words of wisdom coming from you, a very much experienced um, yeah, activist. And it's really important that we include everyone um, whenever we do planning, whenever we do decision making, yeah, especially women and ITs, civil society as well. We need them because they play an important part in strengthening democracies in our countries. And we need, of course, the solidarity of other uh, nations, other groups. So there are many things that we really touched on. So um, there's a lot that is happening in the region. And I'm sure that those who viewed uh, this uh, session have questions of their own also. But, but hopefully, those will also be answered in the different sessions here at RightsCon Online. So on behalf of RightsCon, thank you very much to our Asia keynote speaker. Um, Dina, for being with us, for sharing with us your expertise, uh, your experience, and your insights. It was really a pleasure to have you here. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this session. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Access Now team.